I'm Carmine Gallo. I'm here with Steven Pinker, cognitive psychologist, Harvard professor, and author of the New York Times best-selling book, Enlightenment Now. We're going to talk about leadership, optimism, and the power of ideas. Uh, Stephen, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks yeah. for having me. Stephen, when Bill Gates said Enlightenment Now was his, his favorite book of all time, not of the month, of all time. Did that surprise you? I know you know it. It, it did. It surprised yeah. and delighted me. And I knew that he and I have similar views of the world. I know that he liked my uh, earlier book, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why mm -hmm. Violence Has Declined. I've known him since the 1990s because we're also interested in language and thought and uh, computation. And data. But, yeah. And, and data. Yeah. And he, of course, has uh, uh, devoted his life to um, evidence-based philanthropy with the confidence that it can make a difference. That is, by following metrics on um, how long people live, how often they get infectious disease, how hungry they are, uh, how many people are illiterate. Um, he can focus on which, pro which uh, programs actually make people better off as opposed to just giving the donor a warm glow. And that's very much similar to the approach that I take of plotting measures of human well-being over time. Stephen, one sentence in your book near the beginning that I think summarizes the 500 pages nicely. The world has made spectacular progress in every single measure of human well-being, and almost no one knows about it. Stephen, there will be problems in need of a solution. Uh, we face some very real threats, obviously, today. But why is it, from a persuasion perspective, why is it so difficult to persuade people that today is the greatest time in the history of humanity? There, there are a couple of reasons. One of them is that our sense of risk and danger and probability more generally is really driven by anecdotes, by narratives, by images. Cognitive psychologists call it the availability heuristic, namely examples that are available from memory are what drive your perception of risk and uh, frequency. Right. So that, what, that's why people, uh, many people have a fear of flying because plane crashes make the news. No one has a fear of driving, which is much more dangerous because they never make the news. We also have a negativity bias. We're, uh, uh, we uh, dread losses more than we look forward to gains. Our mind dwells on what can go wrong more than what can go right, which in a sense makes sense because things that can go wrong can hurt you much more than things that could go right can help you. But it does leave us miscalibrated when it comes to global trends that you can only appreciate through data and which we still process in terms of uh, our own personal danger. Well, that brings up leadership and how we can all be better leaders. Uh, I've been excited to speak with you for uh, a number of years now because I've studied inspirational leadership for about 20 years. And I've noticed, anecdotally, that great leaders are more optimistic than average. It sort of goes back to Colin Powell's great quote, optimism is a force multiplier. I love that quote. Uh, but I recall, Stephen, walking into Intel's headquarters uh, to work with some executives, and on the wall they've got this quote by Robert Noyce, one of the pioneers of Silicon Valley, and it said, optimism is an essential ingredient of innovation. So optimism built the place where I'm from, Silicon Valley. Bill Gates says that we should all be optimistic. Melinda Gates is obviously calls herself, calls herself an optimist. And when she speaks about their friend Warren Buffett, she says that his optimism led to his success, not the other way around. So help me understand, yeah. what is the theme that I'm seeing? What is the connection between transformative leadership and optimism? Interesting. One uh, reason simply may be that because uh, most people are uh, pessimistic, at least pessimistic about, about the world, about the objective chances uh, out there, the optimist has a bit of a competitive advantage in taking advantage of opportunities that everyone else thinks are guaranteed to be failures. So it could be that it's kind of outguessing the, the rest of the market mm -hmm. may be too pessimistic, depending on, on the uh, uh, area. But also, uh, there's so many things that can go wrong in anything that you do. Uh, there's an old saying, uh, uh, man tries and God laughs, it rhymes in German. Uh, that is, the odds are really stacked against us. Uh, so it needs uh, some degree of optimism to embark on a project that has it, all projects have a chance of failure. The more ambitious ones, because they're more ambitious, have an even greater chance of failure. If you don't have some sense that the gamble that you're taking, the effort that you're investing, will pay off, 
uh, you won't have the gumption to do it in the first place. Good point. That reminds me of the rest of that Robert Noyce quote from Intel. Uh, he said, optimism is an essential ingredient of innovation. I believe the rest of the quote was, because how else would you have the courage to seek adventure? Uh, exactly yeah. right. And adventures can go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing that's guaranteed in life. And almost by definition, an ambitious project has some chance of failing. But you have to believe that the chances of succeeding are high enough to make the gamble worth it. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. Let's talk about something at the end of your book. Um, I call it building our optimism muscles. You don't call it that, but I, I, I like that phrase. Uh, you have several suggestions near the end of your book. One, uh, let's talk about two in particular, but I like this first one. Keep your perspective. Not every problem is a crisis, plague, epidemic, or existential threat. Problems are inevitable, but problems are solvable. Uh, I've noticed with, again, great leaders, they have a sense of perspective. Interesting, because I had in mind largely um, journalists, op-ed writers, pundits, commentators, and intellectuals, my fa fellow professors, uh, where gloom and pessimism is almost you know, kind of an uh, admission requirement. <laughs> Uh, and I was in journalism for 15 years as a television broadcast journalist, so I get it. I understand. So, so, so you absolutely. Well, we it. never covered the good. That, that's right. <laughs> the, as they say, they, they never cover the planes that take off, only the planes that crash. <laughs> good point. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the um, because I was uh, uh, criticizing the habit, of, especially among commentators and columnists, to treat everything that happened yesterday as a harbinger of the future. Uh, if there is a terrorist attack, it means we now live in an age of terrorism. Uh, yeah. If there's uh, someone who takes his life, then we say, oh, suicide must be increasing. Not even looking at the data to see whether suicide is increasing or not, or terrorism. Yeah. And uh, my, my brand of optimism is actually one that is totally fact-based. It's not that I have a rosy disposition mm -hmm. or see the glass is half full. It's that when you actually go to the data, things are much better than uh, you would guess from the news because the news covers what goes wrong and these are I got pleasant surprise after pleasant surprise and so if, if I if I say life expectancy is increased in the developed world from 30 to 81 that's not seeing the glass half full that's a fact a lot of pessimists uh, don't just have a gloomy temperament they're just wrong they, they just don't know the facts about human improvement I think you bring this up when you say uh, your suggestion to all of us is remember your math and you say, yes. an anecdote is not a trend. Now you're speaking my language, because uh, this falls under storytelling and narrative, because I believe that when a person sees or hears a negative story, and now it's in your face on your smartphone all day long, that that distorts your perspective, because, and I'm telling the cognitive psychologist this, narrative is stronger than data. Well, psychologically, that is absolutely true, and that was the availability. Thank you. The availability, I'm glad. <laughs> the availability heuristic that we talked about a couple of minutes ago yeah. is another way of, of stating that point. But yes, yeah, psychologically, narrative, images, anecdotes are much more powerful. But of course, as rational decision makers, as as risk takers, as uh, uh, as entrepreneurs, as leaders, politicians, uh, bureaucrats, we should set aside that uh, part of our psychology that's way too influenced by narratives and, and get a, a good grasp of the facts. Now in communication, of course, yes. you must uh, have, have uh, narratives and anecdotes, but to be responsible, the narratives should uh, echo the actual data. You should pick yes. the, not just any old, old narrative, but the narrative that really is, uh, harmonizes with the trends. I completely agree, especially in the area of storytelling. I've, I've watched Bill and Melinda Gates, for example, and Bill has said that Melinda is a great storyteller. Yeah. And but but she also knows the data. She's very good because she presents data and uses story that supports the data. Yeah, but and that's but, the key yeah, to be both persuasive and responsible. Let's talk about ideas and how they spread. You've said that ideas matter. I think that's one of the big chapters in the book. Ideas matter. Ideas building upon one another got us to where we are today. Because one idea builds on another, it magnifies exponentially, and it brings us to the modern world. I believe that today, more than ever, your ability to convince another person of your ideas, one of the great skills that people need to develop. Yeah, and we don't know, um, we, we have some ideas to what makes a compelling one-on-one -on -one communication, but what makes ideas go viral, as we say, is something of a dark art. Mm -hmm. uh, 
If, yeah. we, if, if we knew that, we could all put cat memes on the <laughs> internet and they would uh, spread throughout the country, but not all of us do. Some of it might be chance, some of it might be a, a, a resonance between the message and the moment, but there is still much we don't understand. I am fascinated by this whole category of optimism. I call it the new optimist, but I know optimism isn't new. Uh, I've talked to Deidre McCloskey, uh, the historian. I've talked to Johann Norberg. I've talked to Max Roser, uh, Oxford, who, who you quote in the book. I believe, and again, this, this reflects my bias, uh, but I really believe it's the storytellers, uh, mm. the, the communicators who have to carry this message. And let me quote something from the end of your book. The case for enlightenment now is not just a matter of debunking fallacies or disseminating data. It may be cast as a stirring narrative. And I hope that people with more artistic flair and rhetorical power than I can tell it better and spread it further. The story of human progress is truly heroic. It is glorious. It is uplifting. Stephen, I think that's a story that needs to be told. And it's the data that supports the story, but I think it's going to be the narrative and how that story is, is told that will persuade others. Well, I, I can't disagree, even though I'm a data guy. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I don't count myself as an effective <laughs> storyteller. But you but recognize I, the importance. But I certainly yeah. recognize the importance, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.